Hi, this is Pete Lyons with Let's Play Salesforce. And in tonight's Einstein Analytics video, we are going to be covering new features for the Winter 21 release. And this time, I'm totally prepared for things to absolutely break. I'm in disguise as Pete's evil twin. And if anything goes wrong, we can just blame it on Pete and he will never see that coming. So let's jump into the spoilers. I'm not gonna lie, I really missed that intro. So we're bringing it back. All right, so uh, first thing that's catching my attention is that I do see some new features here in setup. So we have use priority scheduling for data flow requests. And I'll leave it up to you guys to read the giant text box here. But my understanding is that basically it's gonna try to prioritize more, uh, you know, like lower latency, fast running things that just get through really quick but that uh, just to make sure that your bigger data flows don't get pushed off for too long, uh, the longer that they go with you know, getting kicked back further in the line, they are gonna start to raise in priority level. But uh, this feature is ultimately going to help uh, balance your data flow run times a little bit better. I would say that you definitely wanna make sure to take into consideration things uh, such as do data flows depend on one another before enabling this feature. But overall, I think that this is a really good addition to the product and I have client facing use cases that I'm eager to jump into on this one. The next is secure image sharing and downloading. Uh, I've seen instances where uh, we lock down security by something as simple as, you know, controlling who had access to analytics and who had access to certain apps. Now, in general, you don't wanna have secure data in analytics without leveraging security predicates and or sharing inheritance. But if you are doing that, you wanna make sure that your general approach is that you're not storing any data in analytics, that you're not okay with everyone seeing on the all company quarterly slide deck. But if you are doing that anyway, you still have the potential for a data leak where somebody could just share the image by at mentioning someone in a chatter post and maybe you are a team leader and you at mention to a user, hey, here's what your commission's gonna look like this quarter. Great job crushing it. Well, all chatter images are uh, created through analytics are public. So that means other people can see this. This is going to block that from uh, happening and help you have better control over uh, secure data being shared in that image format. Uh, and this does apply to uh, images via Quip as well. Uh, the next new feature in setup is the maximum number of hours an app can be in progress. So uh, this is basically if your data flow is just taking, or your, uh, your app creation uh, is just taking way too long. I'm not positive if this applies to uh, data flows uh, running. I'm pretty sure it's just app creation. If it lags for too long, what's the auto kill? And to disable this feature, you set it to a negative one. Last but not least, you thought you could hide this from me? There's a new SACWOL function, and oh, I really think it is exactly what I think it is. But let's jump right in. So I've got a video called Roll Up Anything. It's uh, Data Flow Basics Part 3. I've had it out for a long time. And one of the things that we talk about in that video is how multi-value fields are jerks. So right here, I've got a multi-select pick list. And I actually built out a flow that's designed to parse multi-selects and turn them into individual child records for better reporting. Uh, the bit.ly to get that and check it out on your own is uh, on the screen right now. And I am working on a collab with another Salesforce YouTuber to uh, put out content around that. Uh, but bottom line, we got this multi-select field and I know how many options are selected. And as I change this around, stuff happens and we move it over and we see that the roll up now reflects that we have 10 options selected and we can see that the related list does as well. But historically in Analytics Studio, if I attempt to create a data set uh, or a lens off of this data set, I'm not gonna see the full value of that field. So I can see that this row right here, widget zero, has 12 values in best practice and uh, the second row, row uh, widget number one, has four values in there. But we have a brand new, fancy, shiny SACL function that is gonna make this problem go away once and for all. And let's type it out together. Uh, 
and finally be able to work with multi-selects in a slightly more user-friendly fashion. Run that query. Oh, look at that. That is awesome. That is awesome. I'm going to drag it on the screen right now, make it nice and big so we can see it. And let's see uh, what we can actually do to get a little more room on this. Can we go number rows five? Oh, yeah. Looks like we're going to get some nice space in there. Now, one thing I don't know is can we hijack that number of rows and see maybe we can get some more text here. So I'm going to control E and I'm going to control F. And this is not a new release item. This is just me looking around here. I think I'm going to need a colon space five. There we go. Number of lines. Can I crank that up? Invalid JSON. I changed nothing. I guess I did change things. So yeah, it looks like we can actually push that number of lines up uh, a little bit higher. It's blanking out right here because that's not a supported value within the UI. But I'm taking this to believe or to uh, to infer that you know we could potentially store extremely large values in here. Again, thou shalt not multi-select, thou shalt not multi-value. But if matters are out of your hands, at least you know that you have some kind of reasonable option to tackle the problem. So now we're gonna get rid of this guy uh, and we're gonna take a look at some of the other features that have been added for table widgets. So I'm gonna grab my more DTC opportunities and I'm gonna switch over into compare table mode because you know, I love me some compare tables and we're gonna just start spamming out some different stuff here. I want the average of amount, I want the sum of amount, I want the unique number of account names. I want the unique number of uh, industries. Maybe not industry. I want the unique number of billing countries. And I want uh, to also add a couple of groupings. So we're going to group by, uh, first we're going to group by industry. And then we're going to group by close date year month. And then we're going to group by the account owner. And maybe we'll throw in type, just for fun. I mean, if we don't want to have fun, we don't have to. I guess we could leave it out there. Maybe we'll put that above the owner. There we go. So we got a nice big table going on here. Now, when I drag this onto the page, first thing that we're going to notice not a whole lot of breathing room in here. I can't see most of the things I just added. Well, that's part of the problem that we're really just trying to address with this. So maybe make it a little bit cramped. Well, historically, the way it would work is that your slider would only be able to control the numbers and these groupings would be locked in place. And we do still see that. Notice how count of rows slides behind the account owner. But now we can have freeze up to here. Nope, nope, I gotta go one further. Freeze up to here, is this how we do? There, now the account owner can slide. So we can now slide dimensional values. So for example, I can even go unfreeze all columns and then the whole table finally slides. No idea how long I've wanted to enjoy this scroll bar. Although I am in general anti-scroll bar, this is a scroll bar that I am happy to see. So I can freeze up to here. And I find that as I explore with this, it is taking a little bit of getting used to but it's starting to become a little bit more natural for me. Now, this next feature, to show it off, I do need to enable my subtotals. So to do that, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna show my subtotals. Now, this can get a little bit busy. Um, I don't really have a good idea around how we would even reduce this, but like, you know, subtotal, subtotal, uh, 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 you know, so much subtotaling, all the subtotals, you know, and there's, sure enough, down here, there's one for that. Uh, it can get a little confusing. I don't think that there's a great solution for it. Um, just use them, use them with, with, with care. But now that I have these subtotals enabled, additionally, I should be able to figure out how I did this in the first place. Oh, I know, that's right. I gotta check a checkbox for this. It is not turned down by default, but under this new fancy uh, layout selection, we've got customized frozen columns. So I can choose which specific columns to lock into place. Looks like that actually, oh, that's for like setting a default. 
So I can say like, hey, what's my number of default pros and columns? So we're gonna go two. I think this is gonna lock industry and closed, uh, closed date, but it might actually be locking count of rows and average amount. Not actually sure, it's brand new. I've got two months to become an expert, right? And then enable, expand, and collapse. We got that set. So now, let's see, I got one, two, three, is that three? Nope, that, that, is, that is the behavior I expected. So it froze these first two columns by default. I still can manually override this, but we see that the account type and the account owner are part of the slidey slidey, while industry and close date year are not. But look at this, this is so cool. I have wanted this for so long. Boom, and boom. And boom, there we go. See what we just did there? We collapsed the groupings. Do you know how many times I've had to get around this with bindings and with SACL? I am just so happy to see this. This is an amazing update that I'm gonna do really cool stuff with, and it's gonna deprecate a lot of my uh, hard work and time, and it is totally, totally worth it. So next up, um, I'm just gonna leave this screen running here because uh, I don't actually have a way to demonstrate this, but the Snowflake connector has gone GA with uh, live data sets that from the uh, end user perspective will be completely indistinguishable from regular Salesforce, uh, regular analytics data sets. Uh, again, uh, I have no idea how to get this set up. If anybody out there has a pre-release environment with Snowflake connected to it, uh, hit me up and hop on the channel and we can show off some really cool stuff. Uh, apparently, uh, this will additionally support uh, data set linkage, which is this connected data sources feature right here. Uh, oh, we've only got one data set on the dashboard. So I guess I do have to and not overload DTC. That's half a billion rows. But now that I have two data sets on the dashboard here, we can go to connect data sources. We can go to new connection and I can say stage, for example, and I'll mine more DTC. It's going to be stage. I love using stage as an example because I can type it with one hand so I don't have to take my uh, hand off the mouse here. You know, and, and if I add a data source, you know, if I got three data sets, um, sale, uh, static queries, I've never gotten that to work. Why would I be uh, binding filters onto a, a static step and try to play around with it? I do also see that Salesforce objects. So now if I have Salesforce direct, uh, that this is going to work with data set linkage as well. And actually, you know, just for funsies, I am gonna do that one. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not even sure if I have uh, if I have uh, opportunities in this data set or in this org because this is a pre-release org. So if I don't make it, oh, looks like I do have 31. So we're going to group these guys by stage. Again, love that anytime I can just type something with one hand, it makes, it makes it seem like I'm just this super fast developer and I'm totally not. So we'll get that there. And uh, you know, as much as I love this this visual, we're gonna can it for a minute. And on my DTC opportunity data set, I'm gonna group by stage as well. No. Drag this guy over here. Nope, no, on my all DTC data set. And we'll add one more data set linkage on here. Boom, click, and uh, next. No, I want to edit this one, don't I? Yeah, okay. Add a data source. Choose the third data source. Salesforce select, opportunity, stage name. Boom. I loved this feature when it came out. It's like, where have you been all my career? Close, and then I go like this. So this one's based off of real Salesforce data. This one is based off of fake DTC opportunities, but let's see here. I think it's actually totally not gonna work because of these API name misalignments. But it did filter. So that does mean it's working. It's just that here, we don't have any such thing as 08-close one. We only have close one. So do watch out for that. The fact that it is filtering at all, that means it worked. And uh, this little green dot means we are in fact using Salesforce Direct to query data from a live object. Next feature I want to showcase is the embedded components. So Einstein Analytics dashboard embedded onto an account page. Uh, for a little while now, we have had the filter builder, which allows us to pick uh, which data set we want to add a filter to. 
and what we want to add. And I'm just going to grab something rando here because it doesn't actually matter. But basically what it's going to do is pass that in as a filter. And I can add as many of these as I want. But now we also have the ability to lock or optionally hide those filters so that now the data is being filtered, the user can't turn it off, they don't even see that it's happening. And I have totally seen times where this confused the heck out of end users because they wanted to like roll back a filter, you know, or uh, one use case that I have was, um, <clears throat> you know, you click here, you click here, you click here, great. And then you try to roll back all the filters. But the problem is you accidentally rolled back the filter that filtered to the currently logged in user and now you can't reapply that one because it's not even on the dashboard as a filter. What are you gonna do with that? So this is actually a request that I've gotten from a lot of different clients and I'm hoping that within the next two months, I'm going to be implementing this for a lot of different clients. So uh, last thing I wanna show you guys here, and again, there's, there's not a whole lot of show and tell to be done with this one. Uh, let's go back to our new dashboard. We're just gonna create a query and I'm gonna take this guy, I'm gonna flip into SQL mode um, and delete the limit just to demonstrate that this is in fact now a SQL powered query. So again, I can, uh, I can edit it through the UI, but I can't change anything because it's now SQL powered. Previously, that would prevent me from subscribing to it. Uh, I think I have subscriptions disabled. That might be it. Um, or I'm just doing it wrong, or it might not be there yet. But apparently we can now subscribe to uh, widgets that are based off of SQL queries. It looks like I don't have subscriptions enabled. So, sure about that but I do think that this is a thing but anyway subscriptions allow you to have uh, the output of your uh, charts emailed to you in a CSV format um, and now that is going to be supported on SQL queries as well and then my favorite feature that totally broke my GS0 org when I way too excitedly uh, in spring uh, 20 release uh, broke my GS0 org with it um, I don't seem to have it working. That widget totally doesn't exist. Don't know how to get rid of it. But the fact that I'm seeing this, you know what it tells me? It's that watch listing has gone GA. And yes, I am using this feature in other orgs besides this, uh, but none that I can actually show you because it is client facing. So I'm super happy to see that this really awesome end user feature is going GA. Uh, basically what this allows you to do is to trend the KPIs over time in an end user self-service capacity. So really awesome feature for end users to be able to self-service and not have to log requests with IT every time they need uh, these requests addressed. So uh, last thing that we're gonna do is we are going to end with a teaser. And I'm gonna show you an image of something I have been waiting for for over two years, but it's not in GS0 yet. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching.